Hello, and welcome to my presentation on the percussive post-bop vocabulary of the great Roy Haynes. So let's learn a little bit about Haynes. Uh, first, he was born in Boston, Massachusetts on March 13th to parents Gustavus and Edna Haynes, who are originally from Barbados. He learned music in church and at age seven, after some cursory violin lessons, grew interested in the drums. Uh, he started performing professionally in Boston with Frankie Newton and Sabby Lewis. And then he moved to New York in 1945 to join Lewis Carl Russell's big band. He has performed and played with a host of other musicians throughout uh, his seven decade long career, including uh, Lester Young and Charlie Parker in the bebop scene. He had a long uh, stint with Sarah Vaughn for several years, starting in 1953. Um, he has also played with Sonny Rollins and Thelonious Monk. But most importantly to the conversation of today, more in the uh, decade of post-bop, his decade of freelance work uh, starts in 1959 uh, with a trio recording uh, with Phineas Newborn and Paul Chambers. And then he starts to join some more well-known post-bop musicians like Booker Little and Eric Dolphy in 1960, 1961 with Oliver Nelson, 1963 uh, he also joins Andrew Hill and he gets his first uh, recording and subs for Elvin in Coltrane's Quartet. Um, in 66 he joins Gary Burton and 68 Chick Corea with the last album that we'll be looking at. Now he sings, now he sobs, and he is also an NEA jazz master. So Roy's style, and he has a lot of style. Haynes's inventive style of drumming often transcends common rudimental vocabulary and techniques, providing more flexibility to expertly navigate the music environment that he finds himself in. He has a reputation as a musician's musician who effortlessly adapts to the sound of the group that he is part of. And first with a quote from Dave Holland here, with Roy, you never feel that you're listening to a player whose style is locked into a certain period. And then two quotes from Roy himself, I never got into the rudiments. If I did, I probably would sound like everybody else. And I don't beat sound into the drum. I'm trying to draw sound out of the drum. The first one, once again, speaks to his flexibility um, in finding whatever is appropriate for the situation he is in. Where the second quote from him speaks a little bit more to his concepts behind melodicism, which we will get into. So next, Roy's post-bop tools. There are several. Uh, the first being melodic and motivic development, as I said, um, as well as some others like deceptive phrasing, micrometric expression, metrical conflict, and improvised accompaniment that includes sparse hi-hat uh, compared to previous bebop and hard bop recordings where two and four were very emphasized. So we'll be taking a look at three albums. Uh, Outward Bound from Eric Dolphy in 1960, Black Fire, Andrew Hill, 1964, and Chick Corea, Now He Sings, Now He Sobs, 1968. So first, let's take a look at Miss Tony. Uh, he has a couple of things that he does here. Uh, motivic development and deceptive phrasing you can see throughout the transcription. Uh, the first four bars, the motifs, melodicism, textures, and timbres that he achieves, uh, serves as a microcosm for the following improvisation. As you can see, that first measure is echoed by the last measures of the improvisation. This solo starts as trading between bass and drums for a chorus. Uh, since they do not go into a secondary chorus, that, exp that expectation of the return of the bass ends up leading to more formal ambiguity by having Haynes play a seamless 20 measure solo. Uh, we can also see expansion in the triplet figure that you will see on the third line and the fifth line. Uh, it is both shifted and expanded by a beat in its second iteration, which leads to some more deceptive phrasing from where the musicians heard it the first time it was played. For measures 16 through 18, you can see an idea occur at the beginning of this first measure 
and develop throughout. Um, but where it occurs within the phrase, starting at the end of the first four bars of a new form, gives a little bit of an accentual shift and deceptive phrasing once again, since it occurs during the half cadence of the A section. So let's take a listen to the solo. Okay, so let's talk about a micrometric expression. Also on that first album, the track is 245. Um, and we can hear Haynes playing a variety of feels, um, never changing during the same hypermetric section. He usually uh, applies several of these throughout either a four bar or an eight bar section. A broken two feel, slow four four, syncopated 12 eight, double time two feel without a hi-hat confirmation, as we discussed, and a straight eighth note feel. We're gonna take a listen to Eric Dolphy's solo um, on this tune, the last three choruses, and you can hear all of the all unresolved tension from all the different ways that Haynes shifts the beat or his uh, expression on the ride cymbro micrometrically, but it is finally resolved and confirmed by the final chorus of Dolphy's solo, where the hi-hat comes in again. So you can hear there in that last chorus of the solo how when Haynes finally plays that hi-hat, he pretty much sticks to that broken two feel with a more strict rhythmic grid. So next we have uh, Black Fire. Uh, here we can hear melodicism as well as deceptive phrasing. So the bass and drums are trading 16s and 3-4. Uh, the second half of the first drum solo mimics the character of the melody of Blackfire, so take a listen for that, and then we'll hear an intervening bass solo before the next one, where he plays um, a nine-stroke roll motif, also in the second half of the 16 bars. Um, the sing He alternates them with singles, giving them a nice open sound, um, over three beats, plus an additional three beats of syncopated hits on the toms. 
This is repeated four times, and the last time uh, has expansion to resolve towards the downbeat. This six beat ostinato uh, provides the metrical conflict with the composition triple meter. And also there is an accentual shift here that lends to the deceptive phrasing by having the six beat idea start on beat two of the last measure of the previous eight bar hypermetric group. So similarly to what he did in Miss Tony. Finally, uh, without a grounding source of pulse, such as the hi-hat or walking bass, this deceptive phrasing really lays the groundwork of 6-4, one beat displaced from the original. So let's take a listen. Uh, this example over here is the nine stroke roll that you will hear in the second 16s. Next, let's talk about matrix. Uh, here we have some more deceptive phrasing and metrical conflict. Uh, there's a, so the combination of his decade of freelance work is really seen in his approach to time on this track. He has a non-metronomic ride cymbal beat with various reversals, as well as the standard swing beat, which really adds to interesting and more complex textures under the other two. Um, his hi-hat sparseness also adds to this ambiguity. Um, it's another independent comping instrument for this instance, enriching the texture. So we're going to look at a, two different 3-8 metric impositions uh, in two different variations. The first, uh, as you can see, surrounded by the red box, will be on the intro of the tune, and the next part is during uh, Korea solo. Okay, and now you can see that 3-8 metric done once again. This time, instead of solely with hi-hat open and close motions, we have the hi-hat plus the ride cymbal and the snare drum before the resolution. So some conclusions, as we have heard throughout this decade of Haynes' recording, his technical approach concerning the rudiments and melody contributes to his adaptability and versatility throughout his career, especially this decade. Uh, the freelance work from 59 to 69 places him as a crucial innovator in the post-pop tradition, and his motivic development, deceptive phrasing, including accentual shift, mitrometric expression, metrical conflict, and sparing use of hi-hat all lend to the post-pop language and environment that Roy Haynes creates. Thank you so much, and here's a brief bibliography of some of the sources and recordings that I used for this presentation. I hope that you enjoyed, and please feel free to reach out to me with any questions that you have. Have a great day.